Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Gwen Schlichte. This is a brief introduction to the dawn of ecology. This is part one of a two-part mini lecture series that is based on the second chapter of this ecology book, the very short introduction to ecology. In this chapter, we'll talk a bit about how the concept of ecological thinking evolved over time. And this is largely focused on the people who are published in terms of papers and documented research. This actually is not all the ecological thinking that was going on at the time because there were a lot of people who were probably doing much of the same thing, but it just wasn't documented. So this is a very limited perspective of how ecological thinking evolved, but it certainly does tell us something about how people started to think from an ecological perspective. It's been said by Charles Elton that this is a new name for a very old subject. And what that means is that people have been making natural observations and studying natural history for a very long time. This is not new. There are many people who have been doing it, like I said before, who it's not been documented. For example, the native peoples of the Pacific Northwest have been gathering information and thinking about ecology for time and millennia. But what we have documented is here in this particular short series is what we have information about from largely a very European perspective. But it has been going on for a very long time. People have been noticing things about the environment around them. And ecology is just a new word for something that's been going on for a long time. More advanced tools are now available for studying ecology. And so you can see in these pictures, there are now little tiny cameras you can put on trees. You can document um, and take chemistry of the waters and look at how chemistry of water, for example, affects organisms. But at the time, people were largely limited by the tools that they had available. And most of those tools were associated with observation. And those tools are still really important today. Much of what we know about ecology is largely due to observation. But I have to say that these other tools that are available have allowed us to reach farther and understand things even deeper by being able to collect more data about organisms in general. So this guy here, Theophrastus, who I'm probably mispronouncing, and I beg your pardon for that, but he was Aristotle's student. And he was one of the first that we have documented in the literature for noting interactions between plants and their environment. And he noticed three specific things that were relatively new in terms of documentation anyway, is that there is an intrinsic nature to organisms. And that intrinsic nature, which we attribute to genes today, means that the same organism behaves the same way under the same conditions, usually. And so that is something that was a new way of thinking, or at least a new way of focusing our framework of how we understood organisms. He also was aware of the nature of the environment, meaning organisms respond a particular way in a particular environment. So environment matters is something that is really important and very, very key to ecology. And the last thing that he's credited for is human agency. And what that means is that humans can basically take things out of their environment and make them in, behave in maybe ways they wouldn't normally. For example, growing things under conditions that that plant would not normally grow under. For example, going and taking a tropical plant and being able to grow it in a less tropical environment. So we could sort of intervene in how a plant would normally behave in a normal environment. And I say plant because most of these early ecological studies were done on plants, probably because it was the easiest thing to document and get large observations on, much easier than following animals around, for example. So a lot of our early work by Theophrastus and others is based on studying plants in these different environments. Two other things that we give him credit for, among many other things, is that he stated that the goal of organisms were to perpetuate themselves. And I think we all 
sort of understand that about organisms today. That's what our goal in the great scheme of things is as well, is to make more of us. But that was very different than the thinking of the time. At the time, there was very, very strongly religious influence on science. And for that reason, all organisms were really just thought of as there for our sake, for human sake. And so to think that animals and plants were actually there independent of us, and it didn't really matter whether we were there or not, was relatively innovative at the time, at least relatively innovative to say whether or not people thought it. Who knows? The other thing that he noticed was that there was competition among species, that two species in the same environment may behave differently if they are interacting with each other versus not interacting with each other. So noticing competition among species was also something that we give him credit for. We also give Theophrastus credit for really the first to coin the term ecology. It comes from the term okios, which means house. Um, which is the root of the term ecology, and first use terms like that in ecological text and use uh, use the term ecology sort of ero- arose from these early texts. It was again coined by Ernst Haeckel, which you may know from these beautiful drawings that are often on postcards and wallpaper and all sorts of things that are shown right here. Haeckel was an amazing artist and an amazing observer and loved all things scientific. Some of his drawings are just, they're just my mind-blowingly beautiful. And he was obviously aware of Theophrastus's work and aware of the fact that organisms were influenced by their environment and did a lot of drawings particularly uh, associated with that. In the 1600s, John Ray was another person who's credited for that development of ecological thinking, mainly because he cataloged an astounding number of plants in the area around where he lived and not just cataloged the names and what they looked like, but actually included habitats and other biological observations about growth and development of these plants. And that may not seem like much to you, but most of the time people collected them just as this is this plant and this is this characteristic. And actually recognizing them as growing, changing individuals wasn't really done quite so much. And so to get all this information that extended just beyond what they looked like was really unique. He also noticed that tree rings were associated with growth and age, which was something that was quite new as well, and noticed that when they trees were growing a lot might be due to large amounts of rain, and when they were growing less, it might be due to things like drought. So really looking at how these rings could not only tell the age, but maybe what the tree experienced. The other really my favorite thing that he's credited for, which is understanding relatedness, but relatedness not because things look to each other, but because herbivores, things like caterpillars, might be found on two very closely related organisms like plants, even though those plants might not look really that much like each other. And that was particularly of brassica species. So brassica are like your collards and your broccoli and your cauliflower, but they all come from wild mustard. So looking at a caterpillar that feeds on all of them might indicate that they're actually related to each other. And that's really cool. So that's something that we give John Ray credit for. And he also created or at least documented and set up a overarching theoretical framework for studying ecology. And we give him a lot of credit for that in terms of creating a system of direct observation and then deductive reasoning from those observations. Doesn't sound like a big deal at the time, but a lot of things were just, you know, makes these observations cataloging more as opposed to actually making or reasoning things out by seeing, by observing things. So that was something that really plays a big role in ecological thinking. Now, John Ray was heavily influenced by Carl Linnaeus, and we may know Carl from this two-part naming system. So you may have heard the Linnaean naming system, which is a systematic nomenclature of this two-part naming system of genera and species like Homo sapiens, E. coli, for example. These are all things that are part of this two-part naming system. And what was so important about that was it allowed for us to more rigorously study an organism because we recognized organisms that were the same across a larger 
geographical range because in Italy versus Spain, all these different places had different names for things. So if we could get them all to have the same name, then we could more rigorously study them as a single species. Another important person associated with this development of ecological thinking was Gilbert White, known for his Natural History and Antiquities of Selborne. This was a book of letters and observations on the natural history of plants and animals. And what was really important was that he recognized the interdependence among organisms, particularly things like pollinators of plants, mutualisms, associations of different organisms that survived because they interacted with each other. Competition was another one of them. So that organisms don't operate in their own environment by themselves, that other organisms matter. And so this really is key to ecological thinking. So the modern study of ecology really began with global exploration of science, of basically going places and collecting lots of things. This was something that's really key in sort of understanding how organisms interact and how organisms are different from environments to environments, the same organism. So um, scientific exploration was often state sponsored, and sadly, that was largely associated with uh, colonial conquest, um, going to other countries and dominating those countries, those people, which has a lot of tragedy associated with it as well. But one of, one of the few uh, benefits from that was the collection of organisms, and that allowed for science, at least, to really evolve in terms of understanding how the same organism could look different across new places, but also that some organisms just didn't exist in other locations or new organisms lived in those locations. There were also individual explorers who were credited for evolving ecological thought in general. Humboldt was one of these people who was credited for a huge amount of really understanding um, or expanding our understanding of ecology. Alexander von Humboldt did a lot of adventuring, inspired by many other adventurers before him, and did this essay on geography of plants in 1807, looked at the distribution of plant and animals, but more importantly, not just the distribution, but in relation to abiotic factors such as temperature and altitude and humidity. This is new, right? You need to understand how other characteristics in the environment might influence what is found in that environment. And so this is a picture from one of his publications here. Perhaps you can see it a little bit better. And this is really just a huge number of notation about everything associated with where different organisms were found. These, of course, was largely dominated or pretty much just plants. But to understand how altitude influences it as, whether, as well as precipitation and temperature really was classic ecology, right? It, it, looking at the organism and its environment really is a key component of classic ecology. And Humboldt was one of our great innovators in this topic. And then, of course, we couldn't have a conversation about ecology without bringing up Charles Darwin because Charles Darwin was inspired by Humboldt's science and his lust for adventure. And he traveled in the HMS Beagle all over the world and collected and studied. And it was through this examination of organisms in all these different locations, as well as the things that he was reading at the time, is really where we understand natural selection and evolution. So several different people came before him and talked about the same thing. The struggle for existence among organisms was an influence by Charles Liel, which who also was studying many of the same things. Augustin de Candol looked at all the plants of a country in a given place are in a state of war, very much that struggle that we learn about in natural selection. 
Nature is Red in Tooth and Claw, which was Alfred Tennyson, so a, a writer, poet's observations. And he was also heavily influenced by Charles Rob Robert Malthus, who was a, a mathematician and studied population growth. All of these people and all the science that was being done by them influenced this book on the origin of species, which is the foundation of a mechanism of evolution called natural selection, and something that we find to be the basis of what we understand in ecology. It is important to remember there is an ecological hierarchy, and we'll use these terms a lot, but an individual, a collection of individuals of the same species we call a population. Populations of organisms interacting with each other we call a community. If we take all the ecological aspects of that community into consideration like precipitation, etc., we get an ecosystem. And then if we have a collection of ecosystems or similar ecosystems across the world, for instance, like a tundra or a temperate or tropical forest, we talk about biomes. And then Everything in the collection of biomes creates a biosphere. So this is sort of that hierarchy of different types of ecological systems to study. Thinking about things from an ecological community standpoint is also relatively important in the evolution of ecological thinking. So plants and animals belong to communities. That, I think, seems fairly simple concept to understand, but that these plants or other organisms have particular geographies, which can be largely attributed to things like temperature. So that was something that Augustine Kendall uh, was the was a person who documented this uh, extensively. And then some other scientists like Copen came along and talked about how there are other things that influence this concept of vegetative formation or plant communities. And that temperature and precipitation can kind of predict what organisms you might find in these communities. So other ecological communities that people talked about was Mobius talked about the assemblage of plants and animals and their interactions at a particular location and time. So once again, thinking about how time and place matter for who, which organisms are found there. And finally, Ernst Haeckel, which we already talked about before in his beautiful drawings, specifically said we must study the entangled networks of connections between organisms and their physical and biotic environments if we are to assess attributes that make them successful. So these are all really key and fundamental in understanding how communities change over time, but why communities are shaped in the first place. Some important Abiotic factors that determine or define communities are all these different factors that we're familiar with, like drought, flooding, fire, salt, cold, among others. But really all of them are largely associated with temperature and precipitation. Those are the big picture things that largely shape what organisms are found where. Although all these other things do, of course, play a role in it. Henry Cole was the first to really document this concept of ecological succession. And here you can see him hanging out in the dunes in Indiana. He really based his work on the work of other biologists, but it was this idea of how communities develop over time. So ecological communities and how they evolve over time. Different players come in and out of those communities based on how that community evolves. And it was Clement who came up with the climax theory of plant community development. You can see him here in some of that prairie vegetation in Nebraska that he did his research on. And here you can see that concept that he really rigorously researched was that plant communities develop in a directional and predictable sequence, ultimately moving towards this concept of the climax state, which is the most stable community, which is the best suited for those particular conditions. After that, thought became largely accepted. There were scientists that challenged him, Henry Gleason being one of them. He argued that there wasn't this concept of a climax community per se, but that vegetation was a continuum, that it was constantly changing, and that individuals, individual communities 
were different from community to community, individual to in individual. He also came up with this national vegetation classification, which um, classified plant communities across vegetative types. So to sort of try to understand these different communities and how they change and evolve. But he challenged this idea that there was this concept of a climax community. Okay, so those were all these big picture concepts and players in this concept of ecological communities and ecological thinking. In the next group, I'll start talking about some of the terms like niche, etc. And we'll talk a little bit more about the details of the study of ecology. Thanks so much for joining me and I look forward to seeing you next time.